here in the uh, East Coast. Uh, just want to give them maybe another 30 seconds or so. I see a lot of people jumping on here, uh, still coming on, so we'll give it about 30 seconds and then we'll get started since we're on a timeline. Okay, well, it's been about 30 seconds, give or take. So just wanted to get started today. We are on a, uh, a timeline. So welcome everybody. Thank you very much for, for joining in today. Um, still doing WebEx is it's a wild and crazy time. I hope everybody's doing well and everyone's safe and healthy. Um, so before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as our previous Tech Tuesdays, uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end uh, after the material has been presented. You'll find the Q&A uh, functionality on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, feel free to shoot those questions over. We'll, we'll take them all in and uh, we'll try to answer those as best as possible. Um, from there, you know, you can also uh, send private messages to, uh, to Joel if you need to. Uh, so we have about an hour. Uh, so it's 11, 11 o'clock now, Eastern time. So we'll have about an hour, we'll run through about 45, 50 minutes of presentation, and then we'll save the rest for Q&A session. If we don't have enough time to answer everyone's questions, we will follow up after the event uh, with those questions. So all questions are being documented. In addition to that, everything uh, is being recorded today. So this webinar is being recorded. So if you need to go back and review, uh, you can review at a later time. You'll receive the link uh, after the webinar is complete. And um, I think we can go ahead and get started. There'll be some poll questions that come up throughout the presentation. So please look at the right side of your screen for those poll presentations, uh, those questions, and, and feel free to answer those and at your discretion. Uh, so I'm Jeremy Stewart. I'm the regional business manager here at SIC. Uh, today we have Joel Nava, who's a market application engineer on the flow side. Uh, we're going to discuss the increased efficiency and in addressing the top challenges and measurements today. Uh, go ahead, next slide, Joel. All right, here we go. There we go. So just just the agenda for today, so we kind of know what we're looking at. Uh, we'll we'll talk briefly about who is sick. Uh, what do they do? Uh, and then we'll talk about SIC specifically in the oil and gas market, uh, which is where we are. So where does SIC fit? What are our products? What do they fit into, um, into your organization? How do they benefit you? We'll take a look at ultrasonic technology overview. How does ultrasonic technology work? Uh, we'll take a look at a, uh, the SIC oil and gas product overview, get you an idea of some products. Um, then we're going to dive into the FS500, the Flow Stick 500, which I think is, is a key um, product for our industry here in the distribution side of the business. So we'll take a deep look there. <clears throat> we'll follow up with the conclusion, and then we'll hit that Q&A session, and then everybody will be uh, free to go. So go ahead, next slide, Joel, please. So who is SIC? You know, SIC does more than just uh, ultrasonic natural gas meters. Uh, we have a very wide product portfolio, thousands of different products and thousands of different in industries. Uh, if you take a look at the screen here, you'll see we're in presence detections in the food side and bottling plant, industrial safety, analyzers, flow measurement, which we're all familiar with, uh, industrial integration uh, spaces. Uh, we can also build systems. So if you, you know, we can build custom systems. And what is a system? A system is multiple parts and pieces put together to make one uh, custom type application. Motion control sensors, identification and measuring, and of course, we're always looking at new business as far as how can we help improve sensors and people's safety um, and people's lives, making that their lives easier. 
uh, with our products. You'll see a lot of our products at airports, uh, different types of factories, uh, also at different types of shipping facilities as well. So we're able to scan packages uh, and do all that. So it's more than just uh, ultrasonic natural gas measurement. So know that we come from a long line of sensor technology in multiple industries that we're able to tie in together to bring you the best in natural gas flow measurement. Go ahead, Joel. So as we drill down into what we're more familiar with, our oil and gas business, the natural gas distribution network as shown by the AGA, uh, you kind of work left to right in this diagram. So we started the producing wells, as they call them. The natural gas and, and other products are brought down through um, however they may be from the, from the well pads to um, compressor stations or processing plants uh, where they're stripped out and uh, cleaned up and separated for different markets. Then it's sent down to more pipelines uh, through compressor stations or truck or rail or whatever it may be. Um, and then spreads out even further from there. So, you know, you might go to a regulator station where you're feeding a factory or a manufacturing plant. So we talked about some of those manufacturers um, that we work with um, on the sensor side inside, but the gas there uh, is provided by your natural gas companies. So brick plants, corn dryers, uh, et cetera. So as we kind of step down, we look at the interstate transmission lines, which go to um, either city gates or to underground storage. So we have multiple products already that have filled the need and the gaps for measurement in all of the applications on this map and up to this point where we are now, including underground storage uh, with our DRU. So we'll have customers using our DRU and natural gas distribution side of the business for that storage. After the city gate, it goes down and gets cut down even more. The pressure gets cut down and we're looking at more utility style pipelines um, before it goes to your regulate, regulator stations for either households or uh, commercial industrial type businesses, such as hotels, hospitals, uh, schools, universities, major business parks, um, theme parks as well. Um, so there's a lot of applications um, in our small little sector uh, but SIC has a solution for each one of these um, across this entire breadth of natural gas flow measurement products. Next slide. And I apologize if I'm moving a little quick. I get we have a lot of information, uh, a lot of really good information coming up with Joel uh, that I want to make sure that we get to. So we talked about the, the, the the solutions from all the way from wellhead to burner tip, the upstream, the midstream, the downstream. We break that down in the production, gas gathering, transmission, distribution, and all the way through residential. Now, currently today, we do not have a residential meter, but we can take you all the way up almost to that point. You'll look at our DRU on the left, differential replacement unit. Uh, we'll dig into that a little bit later. Our Flow 6 600 um, and then our Flow 6 500. Uh, so those are kind of our three workhorses in the natural gas distribution space uh, for pipelines, for condus uh, commercial industrial, and for storage. Uh, we do have a flare product. Uh, if you have any facilities uh, where you might be monitoring flare. Uh, so we have, this is uh, our product breakdown. Um, Joel, go ahead. I think you're up. Okay. Uh, Thanks, can you hear me okay, Jeremy? Got you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um, ultrasonic meters uh, have been around for, as far as the technology goes, it's been around for probably almost 100 years now. And uh, it wasn't until about 30 years ago when uh, signal processors became, uh, you know, more advanced that we were able to do the kind of measurements that need to be done to measuring uh, the flow through a pipeline using ultrasonic technologies. And some of the benefits, uh, one of the reasons we wanted to come out, uh, you know, develop the ultrasonic meter is mainly because of some of these benefits that you see here. One of the things about the ultrasonic meter is very high accuracy and linearity um, and has a very large, uh, excuse me, has a very large turndown ratio. 
you can flow anywhere from, uh, you know, the turn down ratio is a minimum of 50 to 1. Usually you can get anywhere from 100 to 150 to 1 turn down ratio. Uh, one of the other benefits, it's naturally bi directional. Uh, you don't have to do anything to the meter, it, it measures gas in the forward or reverse direction without you having to do anything to signify, you know, which which way the flow is going. Um, another benefit is it's tolerant of wet gas applications, uh, meaning because the way the transducers and the ZIC meter are mounted, they're directly looking at each other. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, but they're looking directly at each other. Um, and so a lot of the wet gas applications don't interfere with the signals, but the meter has some intelligence in it that will tell you if it senses that there's, um, you know, a moisture or the gas is wet. Uh, it's very low maintenance, uh, meaning that, um, you know, it, there, there's no moving parts. There's nothing you have to grease. There's nothing you have to periodically replace. Uh, so it's very low maintenance, um, easy to maintain. It's just a matter of looking at diagnostics and uh, determining if you have any kind of issues. Uh, it's fault tolerant, uh, which means that it keeps a historical ratio of uh, um, the ratios in relation to the flow profile as the gas is coming down the pipeline. And if for some reason you uh, get a transducer path that fails, it can substitute uh, a flow reading so you don't um, lose your accuracy. And of course, one of the biggest things with the ultrasonic meter is the diagnostics uh, using the software. Uh, there's a lot of intelligence built into the ultrasonic meter. Understanding the diagnostics helps you to uh, determine what issues you might be having with the meter um, and what's happening inside the pipeline. So for those of you that, that maybe are not familiar with the basic principle of operation, this is kind of a little quick illustration of the basic principle of how an ultrasonic meter works. Uh, on the left side of the screen, you see that there's an analogy uh, showing uh, a boat crossing a river. And let's say that uh, these gentlemen are uh, needing to get across the river to the other side. Uh, and the location that they're going is, is downstream, slightly downstream of where they're at. Uh, so if the river is perfectly calm, the amount of time it takes them to go from upstream to downstream uh, should be the same as it, as it takes from them to go downstream to upstream. There should be no um, difference in the time. Uh, but if the river is flowing, then when they're going downstream with the current of the river, they can actually get there faster than they can going upstream against the current of the river. And so you, there's a difference in time uh, between going downstream and upstream. So we can kind of relate that analogy to what we're seeing with the, inside the ultrasonic meter. Uh, if we look at the illustration here on the right, what we see is we have uh, one transducer upstream and another one downstream. And what we're doing is instead of a boat crossing a river, we have this sound wave that is going across uh, the flow of the gas. And so the sound wave going with the flow of the gas is much faster than the one going against the flow of the gas. And so you get a difference in time or a delta time. That information is fed into an equation that can calculate how fast the gas is moving down the pipeline. So here's a little bit of an illustration that kind of shows that. So here's a pair of transducers that you would normally find mounted inside the meter body, inside the ultrasonic meter body. Now, you can have one pair of transducers, you can have two pair of transducers, up to four and up to eight pair of transducers, depending on what meter you're working with and what the application is. So in this case, we're gonna show an example of one pair 
of transducers. So uh, here you see one transducer upstream and the other one downstream. Now these transducers, inside these transducers is a piezoceramic element. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna hit that element with a voltage and it's gonna oscillate and it's gonna cause a sound wave to travel across and hit this transducer. Now these transducers are transmitters and receivers. So we hit this transducer upstream uh, with a voltage and it creates a sound wave that goes downstream. And then once this transducer receives it, it we put a voltage on the downstream and it creates a sound wave that travels upstream and we measure how long it takes for that sound wave to go downstream and upstream. Now these transducers are made of titanium. Uh, they're very durable, they're encapsulated, so nothing can get inside the transducer to damage them. Uh, the mean time between failures is approximately 15 years on these transducers, so they're very durable. Um, but the only thing you would ever have to do with these transducers is just to, you know, if something came down the pipeline and uh, got in, you know, accumulated on the face of the transducer, you could blow the line down, pull them out, clean them, depending on which model you have. So let's kind of go through the process of what we're seeing here. So uh, one of the things that we need to know is how far apart these transducers are. So we, we do that at the factory. We precisely measure uh, how far apart these transducers are. Internally, uh, there, uh, some of the models have a pressure and temperature uh, sensor inside that monitors the temperature and pressure and can compensate for any kind of pipe expansion. So knowing uh, the distance of how far, how far apart these transducers are, we know the angle that these transducers are mounted inside the meter body, which is approximately 60 degrees. We hit the transducer on the left, it creates a sound wave and it travels across and it hits this transducer and then we just measure how long it took for that sound wave to get across. Um, this is the equation that we use to do that calculation. Then we turn around and we hit the downstream transducer and it sends a sound wave upstream and it's received by the upstream or Yes, the upstream transducer, and we calculate how long it took that sound wave to do uh, to get upstream. Uh, we look at the difference in time that goes into an equation that calculates the velocity. So what we're doing is we're actually measuring the velocity of the gas um, across that cross-sectional area where those transducers are mounted, and then we take that velocity multiply it times the inner diameter, uh, we, uh, the weighted velocity, and we multiply it times the inner diameter to get how much volume is going through the meter. Now, here's the, the first meter we're gonna to talk to about today. Uh, this, this is the uh, 600 XT. Uh, this is the new generation of ZIC ultrasonic meter. Uh, the, it's, uh, this one that you see here is a four-path configuration. You can see uh, on the meter here, we have one transducer here and one across here. So what we're doing is we're sending sound waves back and forth and we're measuring the velocity across this cross-sectional area. Uh, you can see here that this particular model, the four-path model is uh, has four pair of transducers mounted across four cross-sectional areas. So what we're doing is we're measuring the velocity across these four cross-sectional areas, taking a weighted average of that velocity times the inner diameter to calculate how much volume is going through the meter. And there are uh, other models here. This is a two-plex with a four plus one configuration. We have a four plus four and uh, we have an eight-path model of 
which is uh, mainly used, uh, has a lot of uh, really good features on the eight path because you can use it for close coupled sections where you don't have a lot of room to, to mount an ultrasonic meter. So that gives you some options there. Uh, so again, this is the next uh, generation natural gas meter, uh, mainly for custody flow measurement, flow measurement and uh, typically integrated with a uh, custody grade system. And here you can see, typically this is an installation uh, that you normally see, which includes the meter run, uh, which is all this section here uh, with the flow conditioner upstream of the meter itself. And of course it can be, will be flow calibrated to meet AGA uh, requirements or recommendations, I should say. Uh, used for major gas transmission companies for high volume, high pressure, high accuracy service for generating accounting statements. Uh, some of the key uh, messages uh, or benefits of this meter, and again, this is usually used more for the uh, midstream transmission uh, applications but uh, it's got a lot of self-diagnostics built into the meter. As a matter of fact, the XP, uh, if you ever get any kind of warnings, uh, you click on the warnings button and it comes up and gives you the reasons um, of why that alarm or that warning is occurring. And then there's a button that has a solution assistant that you can click on and the solution assistant will go through some fuzzy logic to try to determine what might be causing that error uh, in the meter. Uh, it's very low power, it's, it's uh, less than one watt. Um, it has an option for a backup battery so that if you lose power to the meter, the backup battery takes over and it can uh, run the meter for approximately up to four weeks depending on how much IO you have configured. And of course, it's built on the original uh, 600 classic um, meter uh, with just some extended technology in it. Uh, here you see the uh, 600 DRU, uh, which is a very versatile workhorse. Uh, this was first originally developed for um, the upstream uh, market for harsh environments at the wellhead or gathering uh, uh, pads. Uh, but we found over time, we found that this is a good um, option for uh, storage fields, for check metering, and of course, any place that you wanna replace an existing orifice meter, this is a good option. Um, you can see it has the upstream spool piece already attached to it. Uh, the rangeability, uh, the, some of the benefits of the DRU, the rangeability, again, you can probably get somewhere, you know, around 150 to one turndown ratio. Um, uh, the meter will, you know, even though you probably never will flow more than say 80 feet per second, if you overrange the meter, it has the capability of uh, measuring that overrange uh, flow. Uh, out of the box, it's 1% uh, guaranteed out of the box. Um, so no need for flow calibration for that expense. Uh, very low maintenance, like we discussed earlier. There's no moving parts, no wearing parts, um, uh, no damage for uh, if, if a slug of something comes down the line or contamination comes down the line or liquid comes down the line. The way the meter internally is designed, it, it'll Eventually, once that slug goes away, it'll pretty much self-clean itself uh, just with the gas passing through it, and you should be able to get back into operation once that uh, upset occurs. Uh, it does have an indication of liquid loading. In other words, if liquid come down, comes down uh, the line, there is an algorithm that looks at different values in the, in the meter, such as speed of sound, um, and uh, some uh, differences in uh, flow measurement on the two paths. And 
can calculate if it thinks that there might be liquid coming down uh, the line. No pressure drop across, and of course, again, diagnostics. With all the diagnostics that are available, <clears throat> gives you a lot of good information with what's happening uh, inside the pipeline. So, uh, Eric, I think this is a good time to put up one of the uh, polling questions, if you want to go ahead and put one up. Okay, Eric, I don't know if we need to wait uh, any specific amount of time for everyone to answer this. I will just give it about a minute, Joel. Okay. You can continue with your presentation if you'd like. Okay, can I X out of this right here? I don't know if I, everyone has seen that or not or how that works. So in this next section of the presentation, we're going to talk about the uh, FlowSick uh, 500 model, which is, uh, again, originally designed for um, the downstream uh, distribution market, uh, distribution segment of the industry. But we've also, over time, found that many other uh, applications where this can be used um, in the industry. Um, uh, the 500, um, uh, again, is for the natural gas uh, distribution and transfer and measuring stations. Uh, applications for, for continuous gas supply uh, must be insured. Uh, and, of course, uh, measuring station and industrial and commercial applications. Uh, it's uh, the meter itself is designed to be installed in a specific uh, uh, direction. Uh, it does have an inlet and an outlet, but as is traditional with all ultrasonic meters, uh, it will measure gas in the reverse direction. Um, in other words, uh, if you start flowing in the reverse direction, It'll uh, store that amount of volume in a buffer, and will. And then once you start flowing forward, it'll. Uh, it won't start counting up until that buffer is uh, depleted. <clears throat> uh, here are some of the different size meters that are available in the 500. You have a two inch, a three inch, four, and a six inch. Those are the minimum and maximum uh, flow rates for each. Uh, each of those meters, and of course, the rangeability, these are 1% out of the box. And as you can see, you can get from 160 to 250 turndown ratio uh, with these uh, 500 meters. Uh, here's kind of a, a cross-sectional view of the meter itself. The meter body, as you can see here, mounts uh, to the pipeline, and then you have this cartridge that sits down on top of the meter body, and uh, this cartridge is what has all the uh, the transducers and the display and uh, the electronics up on this portion. Uh, this is, for the most part, um, all the electronics are sealed. The transducers are not replaceable on the 500 meter. So if anything ever uh, happened to the meter that it required something to be replaced, the electronics board or transducers, it would just be a matter of removing these bolts, lifting the cartridge, obviously after blowing the line down, and putting a new cartridge on and downloading the uh, configuration and you're up and running. Again, some more of the sizing, some more information here as we saw previous. Uh, one of the things about the uh, 500 
meter is that it's ANSI 150. Currently, that's the only uh, um, rating we, uh, that we have. So it's only good to approximately 285 PSI. It is aluminum body uh, and has a flat face uh, on it. It does come in a various <clears throat> links, as you see here. Uh, you can see two links here and here on the three and four inch. And that's so that if you're going to replace um, a rotary or maybe a turbine, you have some selections on what links uh, you, you may want to select. Uh, so as far as uh, the operating principle, if we look here at this little diagram that we have here on the right, you'll see that uh, this side over here uh, on the right side is your flow conditioner. So flow will come in on this side of the meter, go through the flow conditioner. Now this is a patented flow conditioner and it's uh, mainly used to uh, get a repeatable flow profile coming through the meter. So it goes through this flow profile, comes around the bend, and then uh, you can see that this is our measure size. So here in this uh, cross-sectional illustration, we see that we have three paths. Here's path one, here's path two, and then path three is a bounce method. Now paths one and two are the paths that are doing the measurement um, of the gas coming through the meter. Path three is used as a diagnostic path. And the way that works is paths one and two compare themselves to path three. And that's how you can do some uh, diagnostics. We see if you see any kind of drift changes between the measurement between pass one and two and pass three, uh, there's some alarms that will occur uh, because it, it's not, uh, you know, your comparison is outside, outside of specific tolerances. Uh, some of the installation um, and options that you have with the 500 meter, uh, straight inlet and outlet piping is not required, as you see here in this illustration on the left. You can pretty much mount uh, the 500 meter in, in any configuration. Traditionally, though, you'll see it mounted uh, horizontally, but you can mount this vertically if needed. Um, uh, you can opt for a 20 mesh strainer upstream of it. And one of the nice things about this meter is that it's it can be battery powered or line powered. Inside the 500 meter, there are two battery packs. Each battery pack uh, can last up to, you know, anywhere from three to four years, depending on how many times you uh, turn the display on. Um, so it runs off one battery pack. So once that battery pack is depleted, it switches over to the second battery pack and uh, then it gives you time to replace that uh, initial battery pack that has become depleted. Uh, you can also line power uh, the 500, which means that uh, you have line power coming in and you have one battery pack as a backup. So if you lose line power, the battery pack takes over and starts operating the meter. There is an option for temperature and pressure. I don't know if you can actually see it, but right here there's a place for a thermal well and a temperature probe right in this section here. And uh, Zik has a temp uh, temperature and pressure uh, uh, transmitters that we uh, use. And if you want to opt for that option so that you can do corrected volumes, uh, that is an option. You also have an option for uh, a 485. So if you want to communicate Modbus, if you just want to pull information from the meter via Modbus, you have an option for the 485. As you can see here, when you mount the meter vertic vertically, you can rotate the display so that you walk up to it and you can see the display uh, or you can read the display uh, easily. 
<clears throat> so this is a very rugged meter. Um, down here at the bottom right, you see where uh, we show a, a photo of a meter that actually froze over, but you can actually, uh, once they wiped off the screen, you could actually still see that the meter was measuring the gas uh, going through there. Um, it's prover friendly, um, which means if you wanted to use a prover to verify the meter performance on the field, you could. Um, it's not affected by any kind of pulsation upstream of the meter, so um, you can mount regulators uh, very close or a valve very close to uh, the meter itself. A uh, very versatile meter. Uh, as you can see here in this illustration, uh, uh, we had a customer that wanted to monitor the gas being flared. Uh, once they started venting this gas, they wanted to monitor monitor it to see how much was being vented. Uh, and you can see here they installed a 500 meter uh, directly um, before that uh, the vent and they were able to monitor how much volume went through the meter. Uh, at this point here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the diagnostics. Uh, Eric, if you want to put up that second uh, polling question for anybody that uh, really? wants to. Uh, Okay, uh, in this next section, we're going to talk a little bit about diagnostics. Uh, we're not going to go into great detail on this, but uh, one of the nice things, and we've been talking about the diagnostics that are available uh, uh, with uh, any of the ultrasonic meters. Um, the, the software that's used to interface uh, is called Flowgate. One of the nice things about the Flowgate software is that you can connect to any one of our meters, uh, the DRU, the 500, the XT, even the, the new flare meter that's coming out, you, all of them use the same software, the Flowgate software, all of them use the same software. So it's not like you have to learn different softwares for each individual one. It's one software uh, that gives you all these diagnostics. Now there's five uh, primary uh, diagnostics that uh, you can see um, with the software. One of them is the automatic gain control, uh, the signal to noise ratio, the meter performance, uh, the speed of sound, and the gas velocity. Um, so on this next page here, uh, kind of uh, we have a screenshot of uh, the diagnostic page. This is kind of an example of what you would normally see when you log on to a meter. Uh, and this one in specific is the 500 meter. Uh, you can see here, here's your uh, velocity of gas going down the pipeline. Uh, this is your automatic gain control. The automatic gain control has to do with how much gain is needed to get those signals across. Um, as the gain increases, it could be a sign that your transducers are getting dirty, so you have some pre-warning before the meter actually goes into alarm um, to let you know that something's happening to cause the gains to increase. Uh, here you have the speed of sound. The speed of sound relates to how fast the sound waves are moving um, uh, 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 from one transducer to the other. If you look at this uh, illustration here, the screenshot, you see that the speed of sound 1399, 1399, 1399. Uh, that's normally what you would want to see. You, wouldn't, you don't want to see a lot of deviation between um, those speed of sounds. Uh, if you see a deviation, that could be an indication that there's maybe moisture or some kind of contaminants in the line. Uh, meter performance. 
uh, just as an indication of how well you're getting those transit times back and forth. Uh, you can see here we're at 100%, so we're not losing any signals. And signal to noise is related to um, how much noise there is in the meter. Usually relates to some other alarm occurring uh, somewhere else. So in conclusion, uh, SIC is a global company, uh, multi-industrial. Um, we have, again, a wide assortment of products, uh, in, you know, specifically to what we talked about today, the oil and gas. You can see we have, um, you know, a meter that will fit any application, whether it's the upstream, midstream, or downstream. Uh, the 500, uh, again, was originally designed mainly for the distribution market for natural gas. Uh, it has a very unique design uh, where you can actually take out existing um, uh, meters that you have and drop in a 500 uh, meter. Um, and of course, it's the way it's designed, it's uninterruptible gas flow and very versatile in all the different markets. Uh, here's my information. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, jot that down with my uh, uh, cell phone number, if you have any questions, be more than happy to help you. And uh, I guess this takes us to our Q&A. Very good. Thank you, Joel. Uh, that's yes. really good. We have, have some good questions coming in. Okay. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll read you um, the question and feel free to answer some. I, some of these looks like I'll have to step in and help out, which is fine. Um, so okay. the the first question is: Will agreement in speed of sound among transducers assure accuracy over time, eliminating need for periodic testing or calibration? Um, I think speed of sound, uh, along with uh, some of the other diagnostics that, that you see there, it's kind of a combination of things, but yes, that is a, uh, the speed of sound is a very good way of verifying that uh, you're getting um, transit times going back and forth and that your measurement uh, across each path is, is good, but you also have to look at the flow profile, or in this case on the 500, you only have two paths. So theoretically, uh, if everything is good with the speed of sound and you look at your flow measurement, your velocity is across the two paths, those two paths should also be reading uh, the same. So it's kind of a combination of things, but it is a good start to tell you if you've got, um, you know, if your measurement, your transit times are being measured accurately, which all have to do with measuring the velocity. Very good. Uh, so another question uh, kind of along those lines, um, does the, is the speed of sound a field test similar to a uh, spin test? Um, I would say uh, it's probably along the same lines of similarity. I mean, the spin test, you, you spin a turbine to make sure that it has so many rotations, right? I forget the exact number, but uh, and and that I think that's a that's an, uh, a good statement. Uh, that's one way that you would test to make sure. Again, you have to be careful because uh, speed of sound is a good way of verifying the transit times are accurate, which means your velocities are accurate. Um, but you have to kind of look at you know your gas velocities and um, you know uh, your gains and and your signal to noise ratios to determine that everything is good. Very good. Um, I'll ask a couple of questions here. I'll read them that uh, looks like I can. There we go. Is there a fix being implemented to coat the electronics board in the FS500? Condensation sometimes runs down into the board, creating a problem. Um, I can answer that one. Uh, so yes. There, there is a fix. We do have some potting solutions 
um, that are after aftermarket. Uh, we do anticipate having a fully coded board um, here before the end of the year uh, that's going to be part of our standard release. So they, the electronics board will have that coding hopefully um, optimistically uh, by the end of this year, um, given everything that's going on. Um, there are several questions here, uh, Joel, uh, in regard mm -hmm. to the high pressure 500. So um, okay. the, 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 the favorite topic, right? So, yes, um, it is. Yeah. So yeah, when will a 500 high pressure version, FS 500 high pressure version be, be available is the first one. Any idea when the 500 will be available in ANSI 300 is another one. Uh, any movement on making a ANSI 300 version of the Flow 6 500? Uh, so you can see we have several of those. Um, do you want to answer it or do you want me to answer it? Well, you go ahead. Um, I mean, the answer yeah. is it's coming. <laughs> it is coming. So, it, it, so for those on the call, it, it is coming. Uh, we are anticipating to have a, a beta model completed and, and kind of tested by the end of 2020. Uh, it's on our roadmap for next year to be released to the public. Uh, so they are working on it fast and furious uh, in Germany. And um, we've, uh, we've done a lot of work um, over the past year to get us to where we are and we're finally getting there. Good question. Thank you. The next question, how long will you continue to support the Flow 6 600, I'm assuming the classic, and the DRU electronics package? Well, um, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I want to say forever because, uh, you know, you can, you know, the DRU is on the platform of the classic 600. So, uh, they continue to make parts and uh, for the DRU uh, and of course for the classic meter. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I can give you a date. You know when they're going to say no more. But you know the only you know. I mean a long time ago they said 2030 I believe. But you know now that you know the DRU is out. Uh, you know and. There are some other models that use a similar head, and it's not sold here in the States. Uh, but uh, so, my, you know, Jeremy, unless you have something more to add, I, I don't see where they would stop supporting that. Um, no, there's, there's no intention of, of discontinuing support of that product. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see anything heading that direction. Yeah, and that's, and that's why they made the new software backward compatible also to the Classic 600. Yep. Okay, very good. Here is another one. Will increase in gain control correspond with additional power requirements and battery requirements? No. Now it's a very okay. low power uh, meter, so you know the the gain is, you know, if it has to use more gain, uh, it it's. It's more. It's just an op amp. Uh, I believe that the when the when the transducer receives the signal, it wants to see it at a certain level. When it receives that sound wave, it wants to see it at a specific level. So if it's not seeing it because the transducers have some buildup in front of it, what it does is just increases the signal. Of course, when you increase the signal, you increase noise. So that's where the signal to noise comes in. But no, it, uh, short answer, no, it doesn't affect the, the power consumption. Very good. If the gas composition changes, how does this affect the speed of sound? Uh, the gas composition is uh, uh, definitely, if the gas composition changes, temperature and pressure changes, it's going to affect the speed of sound. Uh, but as far as it affecting the measurement, uh, that doesn't affect the measurement because, remember, we're sending sound waves upstream and downstream. It's the same speed of sound upstream as it is downstream. So in other words, the sound waves are still traveling. It just takes longer for them to get there. And so uh, the speed of sound is not going to be affected. Um, or the speed of sound does not affect the measurement. 
I guess is, did I answer the question? Or? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. It's, yeah. I think maybe maybe there's some uh, thoughts of if it's maybe wet gas or if it's got some entrainment liquids or something. If that could possibly slow it down, but um, I, I, right now, I'm assuming so. Yeah, now there are, there are things will, that will affect the speed of sound. For instance, as we talked about earlier, if you get buildup in front of the transducer, uh, well, now the sound has to go not only you know, come out of the transducer, but has to go through the buildup in front of the face of the transducer. So now it's slowing it down, so it is going to change um, the speed of sound, and you're going to get some errors that occur. So, but again, that's part of the diagnostics, right? It's telling you that there's, you know, because your speed of sounds are not matching up, you are getting some errors. And it's probably sure. due to some buildup or moisture or something along that line. So it's a, you know, again, it's reading the diagnostics to tell you what's happening <clears throat> inside the pipe. Very good. I just wanted to follow up on something that was said earlier about mean time between failures. Um, the mean time between failures of our transducers is, is around 360 years. Uh, so the transducers themselves have a different mean time between failure of other parts of our meters, but the transducers are near, sometimes nearly 400 years. So it uh, speaks to the testament of our um, of our transducers. The so we have about nine minutes left. Uh, I'm actually going to ask Mr. John Gorm from Mulcare, um, our um, our rep for um, the Northeast area, including New England. Um, I'm going to ask him to come on and say a couple words, and he really helped put this together and focus it um, towards those mm -hmm. folks in the Northeast. And um, I'll let John kind of come in and, and, and say a few words. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to talk a little bit. Uh, I'm a product manager at Mulcair Pipeline Solutions, and we're the guys that reached out to Zick originally, reached out to Jeremy and said, hey, we'd like to do a, a specialized regional seminar on measurement, focus on the 600 to 500 in the DRU. And uh, you guys came through for us. Uh, we know it was a lot of hard work. And I'd like to thank you, Jeremy, uh, Eric, Joanna, Harry, and Lisa for setting this up and putting this whole thing together. And uh, a special shout out to Joel for sharing his knowledge with us his wisdom and putting together what I think was a, a very valuable presentation. Um, also I'd like to take the time to all the attendees. Uh, you guys probably aren't uh, subject to many webinars or WebExes right now, but uh, I know that you might have one or two on your plate and we appreciate you taking the time to spend it with us. We, we, we hope you find it very valuable. Um, at Mulcare, we've always tried to to bring products to the market that were a little more advanced than some of the conventional ones. And when you think about the Zik line, the portfolio that they have, the technology available, well, it certainly drops into that realm. So we're excited to be the, the rep in the Northeast. So uh, based on that, that's really all we have on our end. I just wanna tell everyone in wrap up, uh, be safe. Have a great day and and don't forget to look for more Tech Tuesdays coming your way. Thanks, Jeremy. Sure, John. Thank you. And as as expected, uh, another question came in while while John was speaking. So um, we we have a couple of minutes here. So feel free to okay. keep sending the questions. Uh, it's not a problem whatsoever. We're really uh, we're here for you guys um, and girls that are on the phone. Um, so this question was, uh, can you elaborate? Um, on the check mark, exclamation point, and X um, on the software, the different colors, the red, green, and yellow inside of the flow uh, software. Uh, the, uh, the green means everything is good. Um, the yellow exclamation mark is an indication that one of your warnings, in other words, all your diagnostics, like your signal to noise, your AGC, your speed of sound, uh, all those diagnostics uh, have some limits. In other words, you can set a limit, uh, and these are done at the factory. Uh, we have default settings that we put in. 
uh, but all those parameters have uh, limits. You don't want to exceed a certain amount of gain. In other words, um, if if you normally run at, uh, let's say, a gain level of, of, let's say, 35, 35 decibels, you probably want to set a warning around 40 or 45. So as the transducers get dirty or something happens to them, they'll start increasing in gain, and you want to get uh, a warning that it's exceeded a limit that you've set, and that's where the yellow comes in. Uh, the red means that there's something that's affecting measurement. Uh, a red X, uh, typically, and of course you can click on the red X and it brings up, you know, the uh, information of what it sees uh, as um, happening with the meter. Uh, so a red X is more something, uh, you know, a DSP error, something with the signal processing, something maybe with a transducer, uh, something along that line. Very good, thank you. Um, so that's that. We, we've uh, we've answered the questions. Uh, we have about four minutes. So Joel, if you have an extra four minutes, maybe we can stay on in case another question comes through. Um, if not, okay. um, this will uh, will send out a link where everything will uh, be available again online, um, and you'll be able to review this in a, in a day or so. Um, and you can feel free to send this out to your coworkers and colleagues. Um, again, thanks for Joel for, for doing this for us, and, and thanks very much for everybody attending. Really appreciate it. We understand everyone's very busy, um, but thank you again. So we'll just kind of, uh, you're free to go if you don't have anything else. If, if you want to stick around and ask a question or so, feel free to, to do that. Uh, we'll wrap this up uh, right at 12 o'clock Eastern time. Um, until then, we'll just we'll sit here. Thank you guys very, very much. Joel, we had a uh, we had another question. Um, okay. They're asking, can I drop in a SS600 XT into a turbine meter set without redesigning the entire set? I, um, um, you would probably have to uh, look at how much upstream. I mean, obviously, you'd have to look at. Uh, I mean, the quick answer to that is yes, you can do it, but we'd have to look at what's upstream of the meter, how much run, you know, and that kind of thing. Uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. But, yeah, I mean, um, you definitely can, right? So um, mm -hmm. a lot of times with a turbine meter, they're going to be oversized compared to a uh, ultrasonic meter. So, you know, you could put reducers in and expanders in if you wanted. Um, uh, or you can just match it the size and you go from there. We've had many of customers put in XTs uh, into their system, um, you know, taking yeah, out a turbo that, meter yeah. and putting in an XT, but they had the substantial up and downstream piping. Yeah. And they've added flow conditions. And again, a lot of it's going to depend on what kind of accuracy you're looking for, whether, you know, you know how much run you have and you know, whether you need a flow conditioner and if you're looking for very, very good accuracy, then you would probably want to use a flow conditioner. Uh, unless you opted for the eight path and then you could do it on a short couple. Yeah, very good point. All right, Joel, well, it's uh, 12 o'clock here on the East Coast. Uh, it looks like we have all the questions answered. If we missed anything, we apologize, uh, but uh, we will reach out to you if you did miss something. 
uh, thank you again for your time. Um, I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.